Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In order to determine how quickly sea level will rise and uh, the sources of the sea level rise, you know, which glaciers melt to cause what sort of amount of sea level rise, it's very important to understand the glaciers. And one of the most um, remotely accessible regions on the planet is, of course, Antarctica. And it would be really nice to know what's going on underneath these ice shelves in Antarctica. Um, and to that end, a paper was published just yesterday that actually sends a, uh, an, an, an autonomous underwater vehicle, an AUV called Icefin, right underneath the Ross ice shelf to the grounding zone um, around the grounding line. And it looks at crevasses uh, in the ice. So there's uh, four or five particular uh, crevasses or crevices in this um, location, big huge cracks in the ice shelf, which um, extend from the bottom up, not to the top of the ice shelf, but uh, you know, a significant way up. So to monitor whether these things are growing, whether they're getting longer, <coughs> whether they're gonna penetrate the surface of the ice, or whether they'll just uh, fill up. You know, those sort of details, <coughs> excuse me, are very important to be able to monitor. So I'm gonna talk about this uh, paper in uh, detail. Okay, so this is an image showing the location we're looking at. So we've got East Antarctica, we've got West Antarctica over here, We've got the Came ice stream here, and the X is where a hole was drilled right through the ice shelf using hot water. And uh, what you can see is a cross section here. So the hole was drilled straight down here, and this um, ice fin submersible was lowered through the ice, and then it did its thing with cameras and sensors to measure the conditions under the ice. Specifically, it went into this uh, crack in the ice um, to see what was happening, um, to see the features on the side, to measure the water movement within, within and try to get an idea as to how, whether this thing is actually widening or narrowing and what threat this poses to a complete um, calving of the ice shelf or a breakup of the entire ice shelf, for example. So this is very good. Um, very interesting, very important research. Um, so let's have a look uh, a little bit at Antarctica first. Okay, so here's, uh, you know, this is a decent map of Antarctica. We have East Antarctica, West Antarctica, the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. The Antarctic Peninsula is one of the most vulnerable spots because it uh, goes to much higher latitudes. <coughs> And we have the Ross uh, Sea and the Ross Ice Shelf here. So it's looking in this region here, um, this particular study, um, with the submersible going right underneath the ice shelf to look, to to deter, to 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 assess the cracks that are there to see whether they pose a threat to the whole ice shelf breaking up or not. Um, of course, uh, National Geographic has great maps. Um, you can see, you know, the overall. Terrain. We're talking about the Ross Ice Shelf here, and there's loads of good images um, here of the of Antarctica uh, scenes. The Antarctic uh, community. Okay, uh, things like that. Okay, so this is the uh, ice fin device. Okay, the ice fin submersible. So you, you basically drill a hole through the ice with a hot water drill and you can lower this right through the ice shelf into the water underneath and then it goes around and does its own thing, um, taking pictures, measuring all kinds of information about the environment underneath the ice to try to determine what's gonna ha happen. So here's a photograph basal, which is base ice sediment and topography near the grounding line. You know, it can study the seafloor, 
basically it puts you down below into the water column to see what's happening. Um, there's actually, you, if, if you're on X or Twitter, you can follow it at Icefin Robot. Okay, there's a, there's a Twitter feed for Icefin. There's lots of good images of how, what modules are on there, what it can detect, um, how it connects to the surface, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a fairly good site. Okay, so let's have a look at the paper, the peer-reviewed paper that just came out. Direct observations of melting, freezing, and ocean circulation in an ice shelf basal crevice. So it's a basal crevice. It's a crack in the ice, which it opens up from down below and propagates up, but it doesn't penetrate the surface of the ice shelf. If it did, you could get a calving event of the whole ice shelf or a breakup of the whole ice shelf. So it's very important to monitoring uh, monitor these things to see what they're going to do. Ocean conditions near the grounding lines of Antarctic ice shelves play a key role in controlling the outflow and mass balance of the ice sheet. But underwater ocean observations in these regions are large, largely absent because it's uh, very remote and hard to access this region. So in this paper, they the results are presented of a detailed spatial survey that was that's collected by an underwater vehicle, a UAV, Underwater Autonomous Vehicle, um, <coughs> or this one can actually be controlled from, by the fiber optic link. In the basal crevice located in the ocean cavity at the Ross Ice Shelf grounding zone. So the observations depict fine scale variability in ocean forcing that drives asymmetric melting along the lower crevice sidewall. So more melting on one side than the other side, that's asymmetric. And also you get freezing in the upper reaches of the crevice where the water's colder. Freshwater release from melting at depth. Okay, so when the ice is melting at depth, it releases fresh water, right? The fresh water is, is lighter. Um, and when you get freezing above at the top of the crack or crevice, um, the, the freezing um, forming the ice, it rejects salt. So the, the, the surrounding seawater is, is uh, more saline and therefore denser. So you get this um, overturning circulation of, of water within the, the crevasse. Um, and this vertical circulation pattern Overlay, overlays a dominant through flow jet, uh, which funnels water parallel to the coastline orthogonal to the direction of tidal current. So, so tidal currents, the tide's coming in, lifting the whole thing up, going out, the whole thing um, goes down, I think it's about 1.5 meter change, um, but you can get water parallel to the um, edge of the ice from these other patterns, um, these, uh, this vertical circulation in the crevasse causes uh, funnels water parallel to the coastline. And so this data is very important because you want to measure it now, you want to measure it say in a few years and see how it's changed, right? The data reveals that basal crevasses influence the ocean circulation and the mixing of the water at ice shelf grounding zones to an extent previously unknown because we haven't measured it. Okay, so the ice shells form along the coastline of Antarctica, where the ice sheet detaches from the underlying bed, right, seafloor bed, to float on the ocean. These ice shells occupy about 1.6 million square kilometer area, which is a huge area of the surrounding coastal ocean, and comprise 11% of the combined ice sheet and ice shelf area. And of course, ice shells play a key role in the mass balance of the Antarctic ice sheet because they not only facilitate the majority of its mass loss through ocean-driven melting and calving, right? The temperature at the surface is always well below zero in Antarctica. So the ice that is melting is being driven by the ocean, warming ocean temperatures underneath the ice and, and, and the calving of the ice shells on the coast. 
Um, and when there's less and less sea ice, which we're seeing, you know, sea ice levels dropping off a cliff, we can expect more ocean-driven melting and calving of Antarctic ice shelves and, and an increasing rate of sea level rise. The, um, the ice shelves also modulate the flux of ice into the ocean through resistive buttressing forces. So what that means is, you know, because the ice shelves are there, uh, they act as a cork in the bottle, if you like, to keep the ice sheets that are sitting on land uh, from moving too quickly. When you lose the ice shelves, uh, you know, then the flow of ice from the land to the ocean increases, like you've taken the cork out of the bottle. So several large Antarctic ice shelves have thinned and retreated or completely disintegrated in recent years, and that's followed by notable increases in the seaward flow of the upstream glaciers, which then, you know, great, you know, directly leads to increased sea level rise. Okay, so this process is presently most important in the Amundsen Sea sector of West Antarctic, where increased ice discharge attributed to ice shelf changes constituted about 0.8 centimeters of the 1.4 plus or minus 0.2 centimeters in Antarctica contributed to global mean sea level rise between 20, 1979 and 2017. Okay, so a big chunk of the increase of uh, sea level rise from Antarctica is because of the changes in the ice shelves. So it's very important, a study like this, to find out what's going on underneath the ice shelves, because that's where the ice is melting from. And, um, you know, there, we're, we're going to be future mass loss from the Antarctic ice sheet is projected to increase uh, to contribute 6 to 53 centimeters to the global sea level rise by 2100. You know, I'd, I'd change that date, I, I would say, you know, I mean, whenever I read these dates, I, you know, think, okay, that's a ridiculously far out there date. It's going to be much quicker than that. Um, a major source of uncertainty in how much sea level will rise from Antarctica is um, uncertainty of how the ice shelf will change, uh, predominantly related to ice-ocean interactions, how that translates upstream to influence the grounded ice sheet dynamics on the continent. Okay, so there's complex dynamics going on, there's instabilities that are developing in the ice shelf, ice sheet system, um, so we need to um, have those in climate models, but most climate models, the grid size is too coarse. Um, um, okay, so you know it can be several tens of thousands of meters, ten kilometers in the horizontal, ten meters in the vertical, in ice sheet, you know, climate models. Uh, regional models uh, have a, have a shorter, smaller grid size. It uh, can be several kilometers in the horizontal and 10 meters in the vertical. But these models, they can't uh, capture what's happening underneath the ice, right? The devil's always in the details. So they have to set up uh, what's called parameterization of the ocean processes that exist on smaller spatial scales in the grid sizes. Um, right? You need to, you know, things like variations in the slope of the ice, the surface shape of the ice, um, you know, the, the water conditions, salinity, temperatures, etc., tidal ranges, all of these factors can influence localized ice sheet melting, marine ice formation, and the coupled oceanograph oceanic circulation. That all affects the ice sheet shelf integrity and therefore the um, amount of the, the ice sheets on the land will, um, will uh, you know, the rates that they're actually going and tossing ice into the ocean. Okay, so we have very few direct observations of the ocean cavity be below the ice shelves in order to constrain the hydrographic uh, properties and parameterize physical processes simulated in ice sheet models. So how can we have an accurate model if we don't know what's going on underneath? And this is it's an intense logistical undertaking to access the ocean cavity. You would do it either by drilling through the ice shelf, which is done in this case, or, or by deploying mobile underwater vehicles from a ship at the ice shelf calving front that are capable of navigating underneath it. 
Okay, so there's a scarcity of sub ice, below ice shelf ocean observations, um, just downstream of the point where the ice transitions from resting on the underlying seafloor bed to first encounter the ocean. This is a grounding line, right? It's where the ice is propped, is, is, is sitting on the bedrock. Um, and just um, downstream of that, you, you go to the ice shelves, you know, so we can call this area around the grounding line, the grounding zone. Um, to date, published oceanographic measurements exist in less than 10 Antarctic grounding zone ocean cavities. So there's a lot of uncertainty about the hydrographic properties, circulation patterns, scales of variability that drive the ice ocean interactions. And all of these things are critical in understanding how quickly the ice will melt and whether the ice shelf will actually splinter into a million ice cubes like other ice shells have have done okay so the ice in the grounding zone um, undergoes a dynamic adjustment as it transitions from grounded to hydrostatic flotation which creates stress in the ice column that can propagate crevasses from either the surface or the base once initiated, the shape of basal crevice, crevasses changes over time due to viscous deformation of the surrounding ice column and thermodynamic interaction with the underlying ocean. Basal crevice crevasses, they can either close as they advect downstream into lower stress regions of the ice shelf, or they can widen as a result of increased forcing from the above viscous processes or from elastic processes. If these basal crevasses grow sufficiently wide they can propagate through the entire ice column producing rifts that further reduce ice shelf integrity and then in the extreme the whole ice shelf can just collapse pervasive rifting uh, leading to iceberg calving removes the majority of mass from many ice sheets like the, the Filchner Ron, the Ross, and the Amory ice shelves. Antarctica's three largest ice shelves constitute 63% of the total ice shelf area. There's only four published studies that present, present in situ in the field ocean measurements from within a crevasse or rift, none of which discuss three-dimensional circulation of the water and detailed melt and freeze rates throughout the feature. Okay, so this paper is new because it does all of these things. Okay, so let's have a look at the um, figures. It measures all kinds of things, like it measures the temperatures, the salinity, density anomalies, uh, the current flow, um, all kinds of things. And it, there's a visual. There's 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 cameras on the device which which measure the um, uh, the the uh, physical characteristics of the the ice uh, crevasse. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the data. So I showed you this at the very beginning of this video. Okay, so you see this is the Ross ice shelf. This is the ice stream that feeds ice uh, from the ice sheet on land to the ice shelf, which floats over the ocean. And this is the uh, grounding line, the black line here. And this is the extent of the ice stream here. Um, and this is so where the ice is flowing off the land in, in a glacier, glacier flow. And this is where the drilling is done on the ice shelf. Uh, so this is a cross section through the ice. Um, this is uh, the, the thickness of the ice here. Um, this is the depth. Uh, well, the depth, if you like, in the in the water. So the depth under the water. So near the bottom of the ice shelf, um, there's all these crevices or cracks. There's there's five of them shown here. One, two, three, four, five. Um, they're extending from about 450 meters down to about 510 meters down. That's about 60 meters in length. They're various width. The ice and the ice was drilled here with a hot drill, hot water melting the ice all the way down. And the ice fin device was lowered down that hole and then uh, did all the measurements underneath and went up into this crevasse um, and studied the water flows, the circulation flows, etc. So let's have a look at some of the 
results here. Okay, so this is showing um, this is showing the three-dimensional ocean circulation and hydrography in the crevasse. Okay, right inside this crevasse, this device went all about inside to measure what was the state of that um, crack in the ice. Um, it measured the velocity <coughs> of the water um, in three dimensions. This is uh, into the screen, into the the the. Um, the dot is going into the into the screen. The X is coming out of the screen. Those that's the velocity the, the V velocity component in centimeters per second. So basically, the water is going. Um, it's going. Uh, da, 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 da. Po positive values indicate a northward direction out of the page. Okay, may have, so I may have said that wrong. Um, positive values are out of the page, like coming towards us. Negative values are into the page. Okay, so so these are all positive values that's coming towards us. The water's coming towards us here, and then it's going into the screen here. So what you can see is the water's going to be rotating like this in this column. Okay, and the reason is is because you, you okay, and this is in the the, the U direction, which is, uh, I believe, positive values are moving towards the um, east, towards this, to the right. Negative values are moving towards the left. And this is the vertical motion. So um, the uh, vertical motion, uh, the W velocity component, positive is upward and negative is downward. So this is the positive, the green is upward. So we're getting upward flow here and we're getting downward flow here. Okay, so the water is circulating in this direction here. Okay, but it's also, uh, it's also rotating. Okay, so basically what you're have, having is the water is, there's some refreezing up in this area. Okay, and the refreezing um, rejects salt. So the water is saltier that's left over, that's not frozen onto the sides. Um, and you get melting down here, so it's fresh water, lower density. So you get a density gradient, so the water sinks down here. Okay, the water sinks down, it basically goes up here and comes down, so it circulates this way. And it's also rotating. So this is very interesting. We've got a three-dimensional ocean circulation map of water within the crevasse. Of course, the the, the glacier is stretched in this direction because, you know, it looks like a very thin crevasse here, but it's just uh, stretched to show, show the details, you know, with the scale being different here. Okay, but the vertical scale is still the same. We've got about a 60 meter um, thick crack in the ice. Okay, uh, there's various uh, hexagonal scallop formations on the sides of the ice. Um, there's also, um, <coughs> runnels or tunnels if you like on the surface of the ice um, and we'll show you some pictures of that but first we'll show you some of the things that are happening inside the crevasse okay so this is temperature in degrees celsius this is the freezing point here so at the very top we're below the freezing point so the we're getting ice forming at the top of the crevice and down at the bottom we're getting melt because we're above the freezing point um this shows you the uh so that's the ocean temperature relative to freezing the thermal driving force um this is salinity okay so the salinity is uh you know how the salinity changes within the um within the crevasse um this there's a stratification frequency you get different layers of stratification you know you can see these oscillations here which are the different layers of stratification uh, glacial meltwater concentration here, um, and uh, the current, the speed of the ocean current, and the ice surface m dot change of mass, dm dt, and the frazzle change of frazzle, uh, if you like those two things uh, within the crevasse. Okay, so we're getting some freezing at the top and a thawing down at the bottom. Okay, so these are some uh, images of the of the walls of the crevasse from the um, 
from the, the cameras on the device. So there's cameras and lights, of course, because it's pitch black down there, but the cameras illuminate. So this is the, the east wall. There's the east wall and the west wall. Okay, so just uh, as you might imagine, you know, there's the two, the east wall um, and the west wall. So there's pictures of each of the regions on the wall. So this is near the top of the, near the roof of the crevasse. And you can see um, these, these type of things. <coughs> as you go down deeper, um, you can see uh, different reflective surfaces. Facies are surfaces. Um, you can see areas, this is like super cooled region of water. There's runnels, or the, the runnels are the lines or carrying, carrying liquid. Um, through the ice, and this is like, uh, this, this is another region here. You've got marine ice. This is ice that's forming from the salt water. Um, meteoric ice, this is ice that was formed. Um, th this is ice that was formed just from um, fresh water. It's not, it's not refreezing of ocean water on, on the um, region. You've got these runnels here, or, or, or uh, channels in the ice. Um, and they call these things scallops. These areas here, scallops, uh, you can see um, th these are it's saying asymmetric scallops because they're elongated. And then you have uh, symmetric scallops. They're more circular here. As you go deeper down, this is again on the east face or, or the east wall is the blue and the west wall so you, is, is, is the red. So you get these different features. And uh, we can go down and show another, uh, there's another uh, figure at the bottom here. Um, so here, here is, uh, this is a good image here. Uh, okay, so, <coughs> so this is uh, through the crevasse. Uh, so you can get, you get freezing in this zone here, marine ice uh, surfaces. So you get freezing of the ocean water on the surfaces of the crack. Here, um, in region three, you get the runnels, you get the areas, uh, you know, channels through the ice where the water percolates down. Um, on this side, you get melting. Um, so you get asymmetric scallops here. On this side here, you get symmetrical scallops plus runnels um, in this region. And here we have uh, symmetrical scallops on both sides at the bottom. And here we have, there's ripples in the ice here. So this is trying to show the, you know, eddy currents and the flow of water coming this way. Okay, and then there's water coming in, going up and coming down. And this is the, uh, some of the, this is where the seafloor is in this location. Um, and you have <coughs> different uh, thermoclines because of the, or pycnoclines because of the, the different uh, salt concentrations in the water. And you get tidal movement of the water in and out, uh, mostly down in this region here. So right, so it's almost like uh, different environments here, uh, right underneath the uh, crevasse. Um, and uh, there's lots of, uh, you know, math to try to look at what's happening. Um, I won't go into that detail. Let's look at the discussion. So the observations in this paper expose in unprecedented detail the ice morphology, so, so the, 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 the physical surfaces, the physical characteristics, three-dimensional ocean circulation of water within the crevasse, and the thermodynamics uh, within the ice shelf basal crevasse. So some areas near the top of the crack are freezing, other areas near the bottom are melting, there's a dominant jet flowing through the crevasse. Okay, that's the water coming in, going up and coming down and overturning circulation driven by fresh water release from melting on the lower side walls, right? The lower side walls, um, the, the, the lower side walls are melting, right? And they're freezing up here and melting here. So you get this jet coming in here, basically. Um, so the dominant jet flows through the crevasse and an overturning circulation driven by fresh water release from melting on the lower side walls and salt rejection from freezing above 
right? When you get the freezing above, it rejects salt, the water is denser, goes and descends. So you get this overturning flow uh, consistent with one dimensional and two dimensional ocean circulation modeling. Um, so, so there's basically similar dynamics operate at smaller scales in crevasses of different geometries. The extent to which water funnels through the crevasses was previously unknown, right? We just didn't know what sort of flow there was, and it turns out that there's quite a bit of flow, um, and that affects the uh, a lot of different things like the melt rate, the the upwelling, the mixing of cold and warm water, um, whether the crevasse is going to uh, get larger and open up, whether it's going to get smaller and disappear um, as it goes uh, as it goes further away from the grounding line etc etc there's lots of details um, the ice fin surveyed regions outside the crevasse and it found quasi two-dimensional ripple formations in the ice base with crest oriented orthogonal to the northeast southwest perpendicular to the grounding line basically tidal currents dominated circulation in the underlying ocean cavity um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of different things. So this is basically the present status of crevasses under the ice in the Ross Sea. So a study like this, if it's repeated, say in a year or two, can give us a lot of information on whether we can expect a complete collapse of the Ross ice shelf or whether it will, um, it will um, melt at, at slower um, rates. Okay, um, so there's lots of details um, that are determined by these sending these um, these, these uh, underwater autonomous vehicles or fiber optic guided vehicles underneath the sea ice and just have a you know if you're interested in the engineering I mean make sure you follow um, the ice fin robot on Twitter. Um, and uh, I need, I'm following it, yeah. There's images, uh, images that are related to this paper. In situ observations, we will find scan variability in ice and ocean structure at the CAMB ice stream grounding line. So you can see, you know, as the cameras are moving through, you can see the structures. Uh, this is looking forward. Um, this is upper and lower, and uh, the uh, here here is where uh, the actual site was of tents, and the scientists were on the ice where they drilled through with the hot water drill th through to the um, to the bottom of the ice shelf. So there's lots of additional information that sort of you know adds on to what the paper is finding. So in conclusion. Um, we really need to know what's going on at the bottom of these ice shelves to assess the risk of a complete collapse of these ice shelves, um, which would then greatly increase the flow of ice from the ice sheets, which are sitting on the land on Antarctica, because a, a great increase of ice coming off of the land into the ocean is obviously going to have a huge impact on sea level rise, you know, and with the extremely unbelievable ocean temperatures in the southern hemisphere and the complete collapse of the Antarctic sea ice, as I've talked in previous videos, these direct observations of, of, are very, very important. And they need to be repeated because, you know, you send uh, the device out onto the ice shelf, you get a picture of what, what the situation is now, but we're really interested in how it will change over time. So the, the exact same study needs to be done, if you like, every season, every year, in order to see, uh, you know, how risky we see how large the risks are of a complete collapse of, of ice shelves in, in Antarctica. So thank you for listening. Uh, please go to my website, paulbeckwith.net, and, and uh, support my research and videos by uh, donating uh, through PayPal. It's how I, I basically rely on your uh, donations to to uh, do all of this work that I do and produce all of these videos. So 
Thank you for people that have donated in the past and please considering setting up something monthly to, um, to, uh, to help me so I can continue to do these, um, you know, at, at a high clip, you know, produce lots of videos on cutting edge science of abrupt climate system change. Thanks again and bye for now.